This is Self Work, and I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. At Self Work, we'll discuss psychological and emotional issues common in today's world and what to do about them. I'm Dr. Margaret, and Self Work is a podcast dedicated to you taking just a few minutes today for your own self work. Hello and welcome to Self Work. I'm Dr. Margaret Rutherford. I'm a clinical psychologist and I've lived and worked in Fayetteville, Arkansas almost 30 years. I started Self Work five years ago because I wanted to extend the walls of my practice. I was very concerned about a lot of misinformation and misunderstanding about therapy and mental health in general. I wanted to reach those of you who might already be in therapy or very interested in psychological issues, but you might also want another perspective. To those of you who perhaps have just been diagnosed with a mental illness and you're looking for answers or you have a relationship problem that you just can't seem to work through, but then also to a third group of you, those of you who might tell a friend, oh, I'd never go to therapy, I think that's weak or weird, but you're just interested enough or sadly unhappy enough to give self-work a chance. Thanks to all of you for being here. You know, synergy is a strange and phenomenal thing. Like many people around the world, I watched in horror as the U.S. military withdrew from Afghanistan. I saw the frenetic despair of those trying to get out, handing their own children over to troops, risking their lives to get to freedom. It was raw fear happening right before my eyes. No matter what your political party or views, that's what we were watching. And I had no idea how to help. It was only a few days later, I received a request from a Forbes publicist asking if I would interview the author of the new and highly acclaimed book, Hear Us Speak, Letters from Arab Women. Tears came to my eyes. This is what I could do. The author, Susan or Susie Canoe, is one of the most successful female business leaders in Bahrain and one of the top CEOs in the Arab world. I found her incredibly engaging, smart, and passionate as I know you will as well. Through a series of anonymous and candid interviews with women from several countries, including Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Bahrain, who have faced the difficult consequences of a lack of legislation. They've been jailed for expressing their opinions on social media. They've received inheritances that are a fraction of those given to their brothers. They've had their children abducted legally by their husbands, And they've suffered physical and emotional abuse with little chance for protection from the courts. These women, like countless others in their region, have faced these circumstances. Canoe writes, To be a woman is a gift. We give birth to future generations. We give love unconditionally. And we face unique daily challenges and adversity with grace, strength, and courage. This is universal. Hear us speak. I want you to know I learned so much, but I really just learned a little of what I need to know, what we all need to know about the international plight of women. I want to say that there are men in the Arab world that are also trying to change these things, and Susie speaks about them as well. Before her interview, here's a quick offer from BetterHelp, one of the many wonderful sponsors of Self Work. I'm always honored when one of you reaches out to me to ask, hey, could I see you? Unfortunately, right now I can only see people in Arkansas, but I do have a suggestion for you. I've personally found that BetterHelp, the leading online therapeutic counseling service, is really a great option. And I've partnered with them here at SelfWork to provide you with a professional, very affordable and trustworthy source of help, no matter where you live. In fact, BetterHelp has been a sponsor of SelfWork for more than a year, and I can't tell you how much it's meant to have their help and support here on the program. But of course, before any kind of relationship happened, I tried BetterHelp myself. They use only licensed therapists, meaning licensed professional counselors, social workers, marriage and family therapists, probably even some psychologists, and they match you up with someone likely in the same state as you if you're here in the United States. But I want to talk about what really stood out for me. I saw two different counselors, or (laughs) I didn't see them, but I worked with them. For one thing, it was very convenient, and they both tried their best to meet my schedule. The second thing was, you know, those of you on the podcast often write reviews or send me emails that say, hey, I really like that you make direct suggestions on what to try, real tangible recommendations. And 
The two counselors I tried did that as well. It's not that empathy in a listening ear isn't valuable. Sometimes we all can benefit from working through emotions in a safe relationship. However, I believe you get hope when you see yourself handling emotions that previously you couldn't, or maybe you speak up in meetings where before you didn't care enough to, or maybe your confidence was shot. You want to be able to see real change in yourself. Both of them actually offered worksheets for me to use to get a little deeper into things outside of the session. So I walked away with ideas. You know, we're still in the middle of a pandemic and everyone's lives have been challenged to a lesser or greater extent for a year or more. So that's the backdrop we all have to deal with and BetterHelp wants to be there for you. But also because you listen to self-work, you do have a really good offer for them. You'll receive a 10% discount on your first month of service if you use this code trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork. That's trybetterhelp.com slash selfwork. And you'll find a counselor uniquely chosen for your preferences and needs. And then, of course, write me and let me know how it goes. If your first counselor isn't a great fit for you, they'll find somebody else, just like in non-online therapy. And after all, so many counselors are only working online these days, and BetterHelp isn't expensive. So try BetterHelp, because reaching out can be so vital to your mental health. I know you'll enjoy listening to this podcast. As I said before, I learned so much, and there is so much more to try and understand. Susie Canoe gives us all ideas of what we can do, and after all, that's the premise of self-work. Well, welcome. I actually looked up Bahrain, and I know a little bit about your country, a tiny little bit. I'm delighted you're here. I have to tell you the story, Susie, because um, I literally was watching the United States exit from Afghanistan, and political views aside, I was so horrified by what I saw and what the cameras were, were showing me, which I'm sure happens all the time. And literally the next day, I got an email from your publicist saying, this book has come out. Do you have any interest in an interview? And the synergy or a lot of people call it a God thing. I mean, it was just in my face. And I said, I don't know a lot about this, but I'm, I'm curious and I want to learn. And so for that reason and many others, I'm just so delighted you're here. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's nice to have people who are interested, who want to learn and who want to know more about our region. But um, the parallel between the way we live and Afghanistan is, is not really there. We, we do have a different lifestyle. Um, we're un- That's one of my questions. Yeah. Sure. We do have a different lifestyle. Obviously, you can see the way I dress, the way I, I talk, the way I um, there, we do follow uh, a different uh, background, a different lifestyle. Um, same religion in most of the Arab world, not not all of it. Obviously, we have uh, it's a monotheistic monotheistic religion where um, we have in in this region Christianity, Judaism, and Islam. So. My island, which is right off the coast of Saudi Arabia and close to Dubai, I think Dubai is, is a city that everyone knows about, is 14 minutes away, is, um, is, is a bit atypical of the, the Arab world. We have, um, we have a synagogue here, we have uh, obviously churches, many churches, and we have uh, mosques, obviously. So it's, it's a bit different, so quite atypical for the rest of the uh, It must be. So can you tell us a little bit of your own story? Yes, my story is, um, it, it could be said it's quite maybe uh, normal. And I studied in American high school all my life, and it was at uh, Dodd's uh, Department of Defense uh, High School here. I was uh, one of the first Arab women who, were, who was able to go into that school, graduated from there, went to America. Um, studied and my I come from a very well known family business. I come from a big family conglomerate, and um, we're in. And is that what allowed you so much, yeah, yeah. so much free? And my father, my father actually was um, more, very egalitarian for his time. I think you know he just said basically yes. Um, you should go and study. It was the norm at that time that we did. We didn't have universities here. So it was the norm that, okay, if you're affluent enough, you can go and study abroad. So 
Where did you go in the United States? I went all over. I went mostly on the East Coast. I went to the East Coast. I was in uh, Washington, Boston, Atlanta. I had friends in Texas. So I was all over there. And then my father said, listen, you need to come back right now and you need to help me run the company. So um, I knew that from the beginning. So I knew I wasn't going to be living in the States. But um, I was lucky enough that it really opened my mind. You know, when you live in different cultures, in different countries, you really, you really, if you want to learn, you can learn. You know, everything. Is- I, I lived in France for a year. Yes, I, I agree with yeah, you. <laughs> you take the good things. There's, you know, there's no good or bad, but you take things that you find interesting and you sort of try to incorporate them basically back home. So I went back home and, you know, and I ran a company and I took parts of the company that wasn't doing very well. And I made it into the top three, basically. Um, so I'm recognized as a woman who's, who basically was able to turn around these companies. But I think now I'm considered the only female CEO in most of the uh, the family businesses and uh, there, there's a couple of us but there aren't enough of us there aren't many of us running family businesses I am one of them but I always had this you know I've always been a bit again I was always a, a bit different you know during when people go shopping I'd go to refugee camps around the world you know I wanted to know you know what was happening you know why is the world like this what why is there such a you know uh, why is there such a gap between the rich and the poor? I mean, how can we help that? You know, why why do we have so many wars in our region? And what happens to people? So, you know, it was almost like a fact-finding mission. So I'd go to different countries and I'd come back. And then um, I was always a good writer, but my father actually forbade me to write. He said, uh, you know, we're business people. I don't want you to enter politics in any way. So I'd rather you not write. So... I said, okay, but once in a while I'd write small little pieces, a poem, and one of them, <laughs> you know, one of them became a really famous song. And I came to him and I said, you know, Dad, I, uh, you know, this, this, this piece I wrote became a song and it was produced in England. And, and it's one of the top uh, sellers, you know, in, in the region. And he was shocked. He said, oh, then why don't you write? Go ahead and write, you know. So I started to write, you know. Because I'm saying a lot of this is, is, is towards my father's because we live in a patriarchal society. This is one thing that I think we, we all need to understand, you know. If, notice when I said I could study abroad, my father gave me permission. So it wasn't as if I got up and said, listen, you know, I want to go study abroad. All of, if we want to deny it, if we want to pretend it's not there, it's still a patriarchal society. Till today, it's the father, it's the brother, it's a husband. It's everyone has to give the the okay to. That was very clear. The book, the yeah. dom, the male dominance, yeah. and uh, obviously a lot of the the problems that that caused. Now, is that true throughout the entire Middle East yeah. or the Arab yeah. world, or is it, yes. is it? Are there some countries that are more generous about women's rights? There are. I mean, look. look I have to admit that there there have been leaps. I mean, we've really jumped leaps in, in the Arab world. I mean, from where we were, you know, like twenty years ago to where we are now, it's it's really we, we have changed. I can't pretend. Oh my God, there has been no change, and it's horrible. No, no, no. It's not. It's not to that level. What I'm trying to do is trying to get women to discuss these issues with men. I'm trying to get them to sit on a table and say, listen, I don't like the fact that, you know, um, they say I want a little bit more assurances when my daughters get married, you know, can they have a little bit more rights, you know? So there is such a thing. It's not a prenup, but you can ask for certain demands in your marriage certificate, you know? Uh, We don't even know this. You know, we're always ashamed. We're ashamed of asking. We shouldn't ask. A daughter is always ashamed of asking her father, you know? Um, Please. Shame is not a bad shame. I'm not saying that she's ashamed that she can't speak. It's it's just not, can I say it's not um, something that's in everyday life where she can get up and say, Dad, I won. Is it an issue with that that's not feminine or is it an issue with that's considered irreligious? Or No, I think it's cultural more than anything. To be frank, right now, looking at all the stories I've had, it's more culture, to be honest, is that, you know, the, the mother sort of tells you, please don't, don't, don't refute your brother. He's older. He's a man, you know, and they don't mean it. It just becomes, it comes down from generation to generation. So what I'm trying to say is, is you know, have no shame. Take the shame away and sit down and mm-hmm. discuss it. Because what happens later, we have no wills in Islam. I don't know if, if the, the public knows that. We have no, we have no, will. no wills. Um, you know, when someone dies, will. no wills. Yes. No one can write mm-hmm. a will. There's no such thing. So in Islam, it is according to the Islamic law what you inherit. So the woman inherits half the, her brother. So... 
no matter what. And the wife inherits an eighth. So there's, there's no change in that, no matter what. So, so sometimes I come from a business family. So sometimes I, I you know, I wanted to say, listen, um, I've done this more. I've worked more. I can't be equal, say, to my siblings, my sisters. You know, I've worked for, you know, 15, 16 years more. So can I have a certain share that's more than, than they would have? So you, you have to sometimes sit on the table and discuss it and feel no shame. So this is okay. what I'm trying to have people talk about. I'm trying to have people, if it's in a business family, because most of the businesses around our family businesses, I'm trying to have, you know, sisters not be coerced into signing over their shares in the family business to their brothers, because that happens quite often too, because the sister is married to someone outside the family and doesn't, her children don't carry the pedigree of the family name. So sometimes it's happened more than you think where, you know, she's, as they do, they do um, compensate her, but, Usually, you know, the compensations are, you know, they- so help me explain, because this is one of the things as I was reading that I got a little confused about are some of the things that are are done to women, physical abuse, emotional abuse, sexual abuse. And this, again, this ultimate control of the of the destiny of the woman when she marries a man, then it doesn't, I mean, she can't claim her own nationality. She doesn't have a passport. She doesn't, none of that happens. I got a little confused about how much of that you you call it cultural. I know there's also something called Shia law and I know something about that. Tell me how much of that, that domination and abuse of women is because of Shia law and how much of it is, just as you say, cultural. Um, maybe there's maybe there's not a distinction or a discernment, but maybe there is. I think abuse to women is is worldwide. To be honest, I don't think it just constant is concentrated only in the Arab world. To be frank, you know, okay. uh, people are abused all around the world. What women, children, they're abused. Yes. All around the world. But the difference is the difference is that there's certain laws that are very strict in the Western world about about abuse. Or they keep working on it to mend it to make sure it's there to about uh, wife, you know, woman abuse, child, children, child abuse. Um, in my part of the world, we do follow a system that is uh, the, the family law system is followed. It is a Sharia system, which is an Islamic system. So um, when it comes to family law, divorce, when it comes to if, if a woman is abused, if, we do tend to follow that system. Um, no religion, as far as I know, no religion allows women to be beaten. I mean, no religion no. encourages a woman to be beaten, nor, nor does Islam in any way encourage that, you know? I know that. But you I'm obviously sure. have men or women who are, who are not normal, who have insecurity issues, who have issues. And they it's feel- a misuse. It's a misuse. It's exactly. a gross so, over-exaggeration of what that exactly. means. Exactly. So, you know, you do have, I have many stories where I saw where women were physically abused. And most of it, to be honest, is, but the funny thing is, not, it's not funny, but, but the interesting point was that it was shame that held them more than anything back. It was shame, again, a woman feeling shame to go to the police station, because how can a woman enter a police station? It's, it's an embarrassment for the family. We, we, we carry a lot of um, weight to family names and family, you know. Of support. course. Of course. So how can she go there and say, um, you know, her husband beat her because that's shame to the family, to her, to the children. So there's a lot of shame that holds her back, to be frank. So I'm trying to also say, don't feel ashamed. It's not your fault. And in the beginning, all these women, as they do all around the world, think it's their fault. Correct? Exactly. They all think, and it's the same that I met the Arab woman. So I can't say that it is so different that only in the, no, they all feel the same way. They ask for it. It's their fault. So I'm trying to say, Take the shame away if you can. Try. Let's try to eradicate the shame. If there are issues, let's talk about it. Talk to your family about it. And if it does go to, through the judicial system, I'm saying that they should be tougher. I wish they could be tougher. There are laws where basically where they can be tougher. And I think we should draw a lot of light to it. You know, we really need to. Most people don't like to talk about this topic, right? Whether it's here, whether it's wherever you are. Oh, wow. No, they do not. <laughs> they don't, you know, so let's talk about it. And there's no shame talking about it openly. You know, that this ha- this is happening. We went through a lawyer. And then, the, you know, th- there's always these issues about, you know, she's embarrassed to talk to police. You know, they, there's no rape kits in most of the hospitals yet so so we're still moving forward with that it is getting by far better where the shame has decreased but it's still there 
And um, but I honestly, I know it happens all around the world. I just wish our part of the world would get really tough with it. We're not accepted in right. any way. Right. This, I, I want to show your book real fast. It's called Hear Us Speak Letters from Arab Women. And in it, you have obviously anonymously quoted people um, who have been in these situations. And my next question is, I'm, I'm going to read just one. This is from a woman who it took six years to divorce my husband. Every time the police tried to deliver the papers, they couldn't find him. He kept moving and changing his address. You, and they, they said, you have to wait. We need his approval to grant the divorce. He's allowed to cancel it. And then finally, she says, I just kept fighting. And six years later, we won the war. But this is the paragraph that I just thought was so uh, incredible. She says, for a long time, I was angry. But I don't think about the anger anymore. I think about how to survive, how to live my life. If I want to be happy, I have to think about the future instead of the past. So I throw myself into work or I make plans for my daughters. I think about their studies. I think about how to get them passports since the law still requires their father to be present to apply. And she says, at 20, I thought there was only one door. I thought I couldn't ask for anything better. But you always have a choice. There are so many doors and so many keys. The courage and all of that and the persistence and the getting up every day to fight this just incredibly concrete, rigid wall of no, you know, you have to have permission, you have to have permission. I found myself wondering, is it the persistence that finally men or their husbands or their you know, we'll say, all right, I grant you the divorce or are there lawyers? Are the, are the people that are beginning to see this as a problem and, and acting on the behalf of, of the woman? Are there beginning to be more structures in place for women to, to um, use those structures or those people or that framework in order to fight this kind of domination? Yes, there are, there are changes that are happening in my country, in my kingdom, it's a small island of Bahrain. Um, the, the woman has a right now to ask for a divorce. It was very difficult before, by the way. A man, on the other hand, can get up and say, you're divorced, you're divorced, you're divorced, verbally three times, and basically with no reason, and that's it. Now, of course, you have right. to go file it and that's it. But but um, for a woman, it becomes much more, much more difficult to. Um, they are drawing, I think they are talking about it much more. They're giving women more rights uh, here. And in Saudi Arabia, they've given, they've really changed completely. I mean, they're really trying to give women many more rights than they ever had before. So the change is, is drastic in Saudi Arabia next door. But... Um, but it is still difficult. And the reason I say it's difficult, it's not just if she's granted, you know, you will have people who will say, oh, but she can't get a divorce. That's not fair. Yes, she can. Um, but but the problem is most women stay in marriages because of the kids, correct? And it's more than likely that um, she might end up losing the children. So it is very difficult for her, even if she has the guts to stand up, is to stay, okay, he'll say, um, um, fine, you can have, I think un, up until a certain age, up until seven, the child can't stay with the mother. But if the mother remarries, the children are taken away again. So, oh my yeah, goodness. so the mother, um, the grandmother, the, the, the mother of the, the female can take uh, custody of the children if that's allowed. But it's just not easy. It's not an easy course to take. You know, um, well, let me tell you a little bit of my yeah. own history. I, I would, I had a whole other profession before I was a psychologist, and I began getting interested because I volunteered at the domestic violence shelter in Dallas, Texas, and I spent three or four years there and watching these women, and so I became very aware of exactly what you're talking about and what was at stake, and you know, the children were so often. You know, I won't be there for a buffer anymore. What if, you know, he begins hurting them or so I, I completely understand. In fact, I've done some podcasts on just how difficult it is. I don't care what the legal system is, just how difficult emotionally uh, it is to leave. It's, it's very difficult and, and it's, it's easier said than done, but it's very difficult. Um, uh, and they really, the court system still needs to adjust to that. How, how who is a better parent? Who is, you know, it's it, it's a more difficult procedure. Um, there are improvements. Um, I can't say there aren't, but we we're not there yet. As I always say, we're not there yet. But there are improvements. I think we need to address the issues that we do have issues. Let's discuss them. You know, uh, compare them to the 21st century. 
you know, not a thousand years ago, to the 21st century, what can we do to improve and to empower women? How can we empower them? You know, considering our culture, considering religion, without a doubt. But but how can we empower them? Because you, we can't keep going forward, building, you know, I always say this in the book, building the most beautiful infrastructure in the world. We have the highest tower in the world, the best shop in the world, you know. We have the best restaurants in the world. They're all, you know, they're, they're in Dubai, they're in Saudi. So, so how can we have, look for the latest technology building, all the, the best buildings and the fastest buildings are built in a year, you know. And yet our laws, some systems, some of them are over a thousand years old. So, shouldn't we just try to see if we can tweak certain things up in, in a proper manner? I'm not uh, trying to be radical, in a proper manner. But this lady that she talked about, Elizabeth, was, was so beautiful, you know. She taught me a lot, actually. She said, I threw the the the, the pain and the anger away over my shoulder. She said that I have chosen to go forward and to live happily and forgive. She goes, if I didn't forgive, I couldn't move forward as I as I have forward. And, you know, just about two months ago, she called me and she said, you know, Susie, she said, um, I want to tell you that my ex-husband was found dead on the street all alone. And I said, oh, my God. I said, well, how do you feel about that? She said, I felt sorry for him. He died all alone. So I look, you know, I was on the phone. I said, what a strong woman. What a lovely woman. She still carried no hatred. You know, she really left that hatred back. So, wow, what a woman, which might be, you know, she's really moving forward. Is, is that the reason? Freedom, freedom in many ways. Yeah, yeah. I mean, she, yeah. freedom of that bitterness or of that. Yeah. yeah. And, right. and the other thing that she did talk about, which is which is really difficult for me to still to accept that no, none of us are allowed to give our citizenship to our children. In most of the Arab world, if I marry a foreigner, they cannot have my citizenship. So this is what's drawing a lot of attention with a lot of people. You know, a man can immediately, when a man marries a foreigner, his children automatically can, uh, are citizens. But if a woman marries a foreigner, she, she cannot grant them citizenship. Or even if she, there's a story in the book where she married someone who, who's from another country um, close by, um, he divorced her. But before he divorced her, he didn't get the citizenship out for his, for his kids. So they're, exactly. they're stateless. They have no citizenship. They can't go to school. They can't go to the hospital. So, I mean, is that fair? Is, is that possibly fair in the 21st century? Exactly. And so I want to make sure people understand it. When you don't have those papers, when you don't have citizenship, then you, as you said, the children can't go to school. They they don't, they can't go to hospitals. They, I mean, they have no way. They're just, are, are they do that. What happens to them? I mean, nothing. I mean, they're, uh, I don't know. They, how, do they, they, how do they exist? They how exist, they but then everyone has to help them. They can't work. They don't have papers. So, but, yeah. but even people, who, even women who are affluent, if they marry a foreigner, they have to, you know, they cannot, you know how degrading it is for a woman to say that I can't give you citizenship. You know, it's. Uh, I, I found a lot of women start to call me after the book, saying that you know we we felt very degraded that we couldn't give our children citizenship. They had to take their fathers from whichever country they're from, so they're capable and they're able to. But she said, "Why? Why can't I give my child citizenship? I'm a citizen. You know, if it's paying taxes, I pay taxes. If it's you know, if it's voting, I vote. I work." I'm, you know, so why can't I grant citizenship to my to my children? So I don't think there's a reason for that. I mean, why? What's the percentage of women who actually do have jobs outside of the home? Actually, to be very frank, you'd be shocked if I say this. Uh, almost half of the population, and 50% of the women, I think, work in public public sector. Public sector. Now, when you own government institutions. Now, if you move up the ladder, it's it's very rare. It's not very common. Not very common, but they do work, by the way, in, in my country, whether it's in Saudi, in Kuwait, in neighboring countries, in Dubai, they work. But um, moving up the ladder it tends to be a bit more difficult. So are there movements either by men who obviously are much or do, or do not misuse this these laws? Um, they're kind men, they're generous men. Do Are there men and women that are trying to work together to change this? Or I, are there movements? And there are no movements. You know, we, we, we tend to not have movements, you know. But I do think that the more you talk to men right now, especially the new generation men, you know, Generation Z, 
uh, they have a very different mentality. So I do think that they understand what the world needs right now a bit more or what maybe their generation needs a bit more. And they are, they do think a bit differently. Is it social media? Is it, is, is social media really changing their mentality? And they're, they're always on it. So maybe they see a different view than their parents or grandparents. But, um, you, you know, you know, you've got obviously wonderful men and wonderful gentlemen around. They do, they do understand, but but sometimes I sit and think, if I were a man, why would I change? You know, everything's so easy for me. You know, everything is, is my benefits, you know? So why would I stand up and say, oh, my God, we need this change, unless it just happens from the top, you know? Because it's all to your benefit, you know? But I say that um, if you want women to be mentally healthy, if you want women to feel like they can, you know, aspire to be what they want to be, you've got to make sure that they're happy. You've got to make sure that they're content. You've got to make sure that they're healed. You've got to make sure that they want to be, uh, that they have the opportunity and it's there. But if they continuously feel that, no, they are, maybe, you know, we're not, we're not there yet and we're, we're not as good as a man. And uh, maybe, you know, the, the gentleman should be the CEO, not me, just because I'm a female. Um, well, I, I grew up in the mm-hmm. South, the southern part of the United States, and I grew up at a time when I was a girl, and so I was reared quite differently than my brothers, um, and I was had a, different expectations. They didn't have to walk up and down steps with a book on their head. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. little girls did that, and and so... I think that, you know, there's certainly that's been a generational change here in the United States. And but there's, yes, of course, certain religions that still their their belief system is all about, you know, the man is the head of the household. And and so as a therapist here in in my part of the country, I often have to make sure that I don't make assumptions about, you know, the, the belief system, the culture of that family and, and, and the one I'm working with, because I need to understand that culture. You know, there's been so much attention here in the United States, probably not even warranted, about uh, the, the dress, the hijab and the burqa and all that stuff. Can you, I mean, how do women in the Arab world feel about, I mean, is it very unique how they feel about wearing them or? I think, look, the burqa is not Islamic. The burqa is what you see women wearing, the, 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 like the, that, it's not Islamic. We, we you know, they're, they're, we don't wear that in, in, in this Arabic region and in, uh, in, in the Middle East. Now, so who does? Who does? I don't know. I just saw that in, in that region, in that country. I mean, but in the Arabic world, no, we don't wear the burqa. We do wear hijab. You know, hijab is where you can cover your hair and, and you know, yes. whichever yes. you want. And I think it's your choice. You know, it's your choice. If, right. if you'd like to wear it, you can. In some countries, a little bit more conservative, some countries. But, but you know, people are, are quite tolerant, if I can say, you know, um, it is your choice. And and I have the power maybe not to wear it just because my whole family doesn't. And it's accepted that we don't. And many, many families around me, uh, a lot, don't wear it. But I'm accepted for not wearing it, just like someone's accepted for wearing it. So it is, okay. it is a choice. Now, um, a, couple of, uh, a couple of years ago in Saudi Arabia, you had to cover your hair and when you were there, um, if you're going out in public. Um, now that is not the rule anymore. They've changed that as well. So, no, I think um, if you are in this part of the world, I think it's um, not not conservative dress, but just you know reasonable. And I think it's your choice. And they've allowed that to happen. Actually, it is our choice. In certain in certain countries are more conservative. Yeah, yeah. In yeah. certain countries are a little bit more conservative, but it is your choice. You know, no one so far what I've seen around me, no one has forced uh, anyone to. It's it's cultural. It's the family. If they think that please don't leave the house unless you cover your hair, why? It 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 is it is their choice. It is up to them. Um, so, but we don't wear that on the streets. That 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 complete uh, like uh, the, the tent. Some women, you do see some women around who, who decide to cover their face very slightly. But that again is their choice. But that is is a small minority. Um, we don't. Is it their choice or their brother's choice or their exactly. father's choice? No, exactly. And that is something that you'll have to ask each one. But in general, it is the patriarch of the house, whoever. It, it, sometimes, yeah, it, it is a bit harder. But, you know, some it's like you have even in, in, in the South. Some families are more conservative than others. So, yeah. You bet. Yeah, you have that, yeah. 
So I, I was curious, and this morning I checked my own my own podcast, the Self Work Podcast, and um, I, I looked to see which countries had downloaded the podcast in in your area of the world, and there were some countries where it was not downloaded. Yeah, I don't know. Look, social media. When I interviewed Generation Z, this is really funny, Margaret. Social media is the reason why they think change is going to happen faster, and I never thought of that. Until I interviewed them, my daughter basically gave, gave me that idea because every time I talked to her, she gave me another opinion. I'm like, you're very opinionated. You're very strong and, and independent. And she's like, um, so that's why I asked her to write a letter to me, which is in the book. But um, I, I it was very moving. It was. I was shocked. That this is really exactly how it happened. But, um, but to them, social media is not going to keep quiet. You know, you can... You can tell the press not to speak anymore, right? You can tell the press not to cover a certain issue about maybe an abuse of a woman. You can, you can control the press, right? You can't control social media. Mm-mm. So when something happens and it's on social media, everyone hears about it. And, and these young people are not listening to the traditional press that we have. They're listening to podcasts like what you're doing. They're listening right. to what's going on now in the world. And so they think that that's the change. Social media is going to create the change and they're, and they're willing to make create the change. So I was a bit shocked because I, I was not very social media savvy. You know, I was always a bit shying away from all of these things. But, um, but maybe they're right. Maybe they have something that, that I, I didn't get. I think they might be correct. Well, I know I didn't really understand social media until I began blogging back in almost 10 years ago now and then podcasting about actually it's five years ago this week. So, and I, I've been amazed how many people from all over the world I heard this week from a young woman from the Philippines that, you know, found my book. And I've been flabbergasted at the, the extent of what my little podcast can do. And of course, there, there are many that are far larger than mine and have more of an impact. But I love spreading the message about good mental health and therapy. What does mental health look like in Bahrain or some of the other countries? Oh, we still need to work on that, to be frank. You know, um, we don't have a lot yet. You know, I, I don't like to generalize because maybe someone will stand up and say, oh, no, you're wrong. But we don't have a lot of therapy. I mean, we do have therapists, but it's it's not as common to say I'm I'm speaking to a therapist. What's changing, I think, right now is Zoom, which is fantastic. No one has to go to, to the therapist's office, you know. So I think that might be the change that that's needed. It's, uh, you know, people still have to say there's nothing wrong if I feel bad. I need to seek help. And I need to talk about it. And this is what I want the book to actually achieve in the end. I wish I could make do something where it's worldwide, where people, if they need help, can, you know, call someone. And, you know, each region has somewhere where they can call. We can have lawyers pro bono. We can have therapists that can talk to them. I think it's still needed. And, and this is a culture that it's still starting. We're not there yet. Obviously, we're not even halfway there. But right. um, there's no shame. I mean, we need help. We all need help, you know, at different points in our lives. We all need help. I need help uh, uh, with business advice. I need help with my mental health. Everyone needs it. And there's no shame in asking for it. In business, it's considered more consultation, which is actually a model yeah. that I've tried to espouse here, that therapy or, or getting therapy is also about consulting with someone. It's just I have years of experience of listening to people try to solve their own problems and trying to address trauma or whatever is, is in their lives. And I can pass on to the person in front of me what I saw this person learn. I mean, it's, it's, I'm just consulting. I know what works and for some people and then what works for others better. And so it's just an experiential kind of thing more than anything else. Let me ask you about any, it sounds like you really may not have had any repercussions from writing this book. Your book reminded me of a book called The Help here in the United States. I don't know if you saw the movie. It was actually a book about a Southern writer who found a lot of African-American or black uh, housekeepers at the time back in the 50s or 60s that came forward and talked about what it was really like to work for white people. And a few good stories, many more that were cruel or abusive or degrading. 
And, you know, the women who came forward were very reticent at first to come forward for fear of of uh, finding the discovery and that kind of thing. But they found power in coming forward and and putting together a book. It's a very moving story. And I, it's one of my favorite movies. But I wondered how frightened were the people that came to you and said, I want to be a part of this book. There were some, I have to admit, there's certain, um, there were some countries that, that the people, women were more vocal, in, that they didn't think there would be any repercussions. They wanted to say whatever they wanted to say, and they, they're fine with it. And in some countries, no, they were a little bit afraid. They didn't want to be identified. But they wanted their story told, which was very interesting to me. Yes. Everyone, and there's so many other stories I didn't include, you know. They wanted their stories to be told because they wanted other women to be wary, to be careful, to not go into that same trap, just to be careful and to have their mind open and be aware of all these issues. But they wanted their story to be told. But yes, they were a little bit afraid of, of having their names there. There's still, you know, we still come from communities that are a bit small. I mean, my population is over a million only. So you can imagine how small the, the country is you know our, our most populated country in, in the gulf is 30 something million um of course egypt is, is hitting 100 million so so people are known so you know you say a, a family last name you know oh they're like oh you know did you you know so people are are afraid of that but generation z is not this is what i found a bit shocking when i sat with them i had no intention of having interviews with generation z i didn't understand how different they were even though i raised them you know for the United States, for people, Generation Z for her is Generation Z for us. So, oh, yes. <laughs> so yes, easy. Yeah. Generation Z. You're right. Yeah. My accent. Yes. We say Z. Z. Um, so um, they didn't care. They even talked about their parents' relationship. And what, what the common theme was that they said that, um, that all their mothers told them that, please, whatever you do in life, continue doing something. Don't stay at home and do nothing. In other words, maybe we made that mistake. Keep being goal-driven, I think. That's what they're trying to say. Whatever it is in the house, but just always have objectives and have goals, you know? So that, that's the impression I got. And they talked about their, their, their parents' relationship, how it was, how it got better. And they're very open about these things. We would never be open, you know? And then I asked one of them, I said, you know, what would you do if your husband told you, you're so beautiful, you know, I'd love it if you could cover your hair, you know, cover yourself, you know? And she answered in such a polite way, I had to just be quiet. She said, my grandfather said, would you ever cover a rose? So I kept quiet. I said, oh, smart girl, wow. Yes. <laughs> I think I, you know, but, um, but they have, you know, they're, they're different. They're, um, they're connected. They're, they're goal-driven. They're strong. They have opinions and they don't mind seeing them, you know. Both men um, and women, right? Yes, yes, yes. Even the men. And the men allow, I, again, see, even I, they're caught into that trap. Allow the woman. See, I'm caught into that trap because I'm from that generation that says men allow us to speak. Um, so, yes, they, they really think that they have a right. You see, this is what our generation didn't think we have a right. You know, we, you know, we're respected and women are very well respected. But we, I don't think we grew up with the attitude of I have a right to speak when I want to speak. No. We didn't grow up with that attitude. So this generation Z is has that um, has that now good or bad. I don't know. God help them, but I don't know. But let's see what they do. But they they think they're going to create the change. They have no issues at all, and they really feel they're global citizens. Mm-hmm. Um, the way they think now. I mean, if you come to, to my part of the world, Margaret, you'd be shocked. I mean, we're just. Um, I don't think you would feel that great difference. You know, you see similar rest. We also have Starbucks everywhere. We have Starbucks <laughs> everywhere. You know, we have all these other. You know, all these other um, names around. You know, it's it's. You don't. You are global citizens when you come to an infrastructure that's ready. So I say we have it all. Can't we at least just sit and think about laws and how to empower women a bit more? That's what I'm trying to say. So what I started with, I mean, I thought, okay, I can help by interviewing Susie Canoe, and that's how I'm going to help. How can a general listener to self-work help? You know, I've been trying to actually think about how can everyone help me in this. And I think I, I, I touched upon it is that I would like to do, do a think tank or something where people do get together, great minds get together, everyone in the region. And let's see how we can help by just basically providing pro bono, you know, therapy. People need to talk to someone. 
whether it's shelters may be a step too, but just talk, talk to someone and have people have know what their rights are, what kind of rights, what, what kind of lawyers, if they can get a lawyer. Um, and right now, thank God, there's a telephone. So they don't need to go out anywhere. They can actually speak. So we're one step there, but I, I would like to create a movement where we can all get together and, and help somehow. So I guess step one is, you know, you can either hear the book on audio, you can correspond to it on, on, on Facebook, you can see if you'd like to help in any way, you can say that you'd like to do something pro bono, if you'd like to be part of a think tank, it'd be my pleasure. And um, I'd like to see where we can move with it, because I, I really think it's a sh- shame if we don't move forward with something. I mean, I'd like to do something, to make a difference. You know, writing the book was, was a beautiful journey for me. And, and you know, I loved writing and, and I love meeting these women. I mean, I wish everyone could meet them. You guys would, would just, you'd love these women I met and the others that their stories weren't in the book. But I would like to also continue to make a difference. So if anyone has ideas, there's a Facebook, there's Instagram. It's all under so, the name. Of so the you have a Facebook page under your name? And Instagram. What is it? Under Hear Us Speak, under the book's name, Hear Us Speak. And there's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. So I'm there connected on social media. If you have any ideas, if you'd like to offer services, let's see where we can go with it. Let's do a movement where we can try to influence women to basically feel no shame, feel they have power and feel like they can connect with people that they need to talk to. And then maybe we can influence some decisions here with, with people in power. That would be you know? wonderful. That would be yeah. wonderful. And I will try I that. Would. As, you know, um, I'm sure COVID has been difficult there as well. Are there traveling restrictions now or not? Now we're, we're much better. No, there aren't. We never close our airport down, which is, which is great. But uh, there wasn't anywhere where we could go. But we never really close the airport down. <laughs> Everywhere else was almost closed, but um, it's much better, you know, as long as you're vaccinated, I think you're yes. fine. You know, people are traveling, yeah. Well, I, and let me ask you, not, I don't mean to be overly personal, are you married as well? Yeah, I have three kids. I have, um, my eldest is a boy, he's uh, 23. I have another one who's 22. One's a lawyer, one's a businessman. And my daughter, who's in the book, her name is Lara. She's 18 and she's studying biomedical research. She wants to make a difference in her life. Yeah. yeah okay. So um, they're all quite. Well, has your husband been supportive of all this? Yes. 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 He's How always wonderful. been. Wonderful. Supportive. Uh, he's been, you know, he never stood in my way. He, he said, do what you need to do. So um, I've been blessed. And I had a father who passed away, which is who I dedicated the book to, who never probably made me feel like I was a female, you know, which is which is funny, which is a bit different. But then I, you know, I, I hear stories. And then after his death, yeah, things were a little bit more difficult. You know, I realized, oh, my God, I am the female, you know. So um, but lovely man. Let me be, except he never let me, allowed me to write the beginning. He finally did later. <laughs> <laughs> you had to kind of slip that one on him. Slip that yeah, one yeah. On. <laughs> and the song, I, I wrote a song, you know, so he's like, okay, it's a song. You're okay. Keep writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a funny story. Yeah, yeah. Susie, thank you so very much. And the book again is Hear Us Speak, Letters from Arab Women by Susie Canoe. Uh, is that how you say your last name? Ken? Yeah, yeah. You- and, uh, Anu, Anu, yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it was I, lo- thank you, Margaret. Thank it was you. lovely to meet you as well. And um, I will definitely join your Twitter and your Instagram and all that stuff. And and uh, I'll certainly um, encourage self work listeners to do the same. I think the more we understand one another and we can help one another, then that is all for the good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Have a nice day. Thank Take care. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I want to thank Susie again for being here on Self Work. I have the link to her book, Hear Us Speak, in the show notes. I've read it cover to cover, and I was very moved by the stories. And will continue to look for what I can personally do. Thank you, as always, for being here and listening to this bonus episode of Self Work. My own book, Perfectly Hidden Depression, remains for sale anywhere you buy books. It's in audiobook, ebook, and paperback. I just talked to a woman yesterday who was calling me about her son, who she believes has this incredibly dangerous form of perfectionism and need to be in emotional control at all times. If you know someone like that, please think about either talking with them or getting the book yourself 
so that you can approach them with empathy and understanding. Thanks again to those of you who've left ratings and reviews. When I think that 267 people from around the world took their time on Amazon to leave Perfectly Hidden Depression review or rating, I am really touched. And I feel the same kind of gratitude when you make a review or a rating wherever you listen to self-work. That puts a huge smile on my face as I get to hear from you what you value about self-work. Don't forget the speak pipe option as well, because that way you can leave me a voicemail. I can hear your voice. The speak pipe option is available on my website, drmargaretrutherford.com, but also in every episode's show note. You can email me at askdrmargaret at drmargaretrutherford.com. You can join me for an interactive podcast that's new on Fireside Chat by just going to firesidechat.com slash margaretrutherford. That's firesidechat.com slash margaretrutherford. You do have to have an iPhone right now. and They're working on an Android version. I'd love to have you there and actually talk with you. And then, of course, there's my Facebook closed group at facebook.com slash groups slash selfwork. Thank you for being here. Please take very good care. I'm Dr. Margaret, and this has been Self Work.